Funding for Shaper Illus is provided by Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. So I was watching Puss in Boots The Last Wish for the fifth time, and then it hit me. Isn't it cool that this movie has villains? Like, actual bad guys who serve as obstacles to the protagonists throughout the entirety of the film? Like, they went ahead and made a terrifying dramatic villain you're constantly scared of, a goofy comedic villain who serves as a legit threat and a wonderful source of laughs, and an affable villain team who slowly develop into a redeemable second set of protagonists. They threw all these classic villain archetypes into one movie, executed them all perfectly, and really made me question what the hell other animated studios are doing in terms of their villains. Or lack thereof. And when I say other animated studios, I mean Disney. And Pixar to a lesser extent, but mainly this is a Disney problem. It seems like the era of the twist villain that I complained about almost five years ago, what the f***? has finally ended, and now we seem to have entered the generational trauma or personal drama era of Disney antagonists. Take your pick. And it was fine at first. You know, I think we were all happy that Disney was finally out of their twist villain phase. I may have hated Ralph Breaks the Internet, but hey, I would have hated it even more if it had a twist villain. So, you know, that's a win, I guess. But as time has gone on, it's become increasingly clear that the stories Disney wants to tell in these movies aren't really working. And I'm starting to think a major part as to why these films have been consistently falling apart story-wise, at least in my opinion, is because of their lack of villains. Now, everyone knows at this point that I love Encanto. Hell, it's the only post-Moana Disney film that I even liked, let alone loved. And I think a major reason why that is, is because of how personal and real the main conflict is, in spite of the magical elements. There's no grand journey that the characters need to go on, the story is just Mirabelle trying to figure out what's causing the literal and figurative cracks in the family. The movie grounds itself in this one location, and allows for the characters and their conflicts to really be explored more thoroughly than any other modern Disney film. The fact that there's no villain is perfect here. Alma is the antagonist, but she's a three-dimensional person who suffered a lot of trauma, and who's able to change when she realizes the harm she's doing to her family. Bruno is vilified by everyone in the family and the town, but he turns out to be a nice dude who took the fall and disappeared to protect Mirabelle. These subversions work because the movie is allowed to focus solely on the family dynamic, rather than trying to divide its time between exploring that dynamic and giving us this grand adventure story. Unfortunately, every other modern Disney film doesn't overcome this pitfall. They want their heroes to be three-dimensional and have these interpersonal conflicts they need to overcome, but they also want these conflicts to be shoved into a typical hero's journey adventure story. And I'm sorry to say, but it's hard to find yourself invested in a journey adventure story without an explicit antagonist driving that side of the film's conflict. If Strange World wants to do what Encanto did and delve into the interpersonal relationships of the family, then what's the point of the adventure aspect of the film? It just becomes a distraction from the familial conflicts the main characters have with each other. But a clear antagonist that they all have to unite to overcome would help strengthen both the family and adventure aspects of the film. I mentioned in my Disney ranking that a movie with such a clear environmental message would have benefited greatly from a greedy villain who wants to exploit the environment for personal gain. Because it adds way more urgency to the story, and especially the final acts, that the movie as is doesn't have. The environmental message feels undercooked because it's fighting for screen time with the family conflicts, making for a really muddled and unengaging screenplay. Meanwhile, there's Ralph Breaks the Internet! Ugh, I'll keep this brief. Like I alluded to earlier, I don't think the lack of villain here is a problem. On paper, I like how the initial conflict is just needing money for a new steering wheel, and Ralph being insecure about Vanellope wanting to find new experiences. The problem is how awful the execution is. But a villain wouldn't have saved this piece of shit. It probably would have just made the movie even worse and more unfocused and terrible. And yeah, we're done talking about this. Frozen 2. So this movie absolutely suffers from a massive villain void. The stakes are pretty vague because we have no idea why the spirits are angry or what they even want. Nor is there a super drastic threat that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, everyone's been kicked out of their homes, but nobody's lives are in immediate danger and it's very hard to feel threatened by this vague conflict that isn't fully elaborated on until much later in the film. Now, there is a villain who kicked off the main conflict, and that's Anna and Elsa's grandfather. A guy who's been dead for years so he can't interact with the main characters or drive any aspect of the plot in the modern day. Well, here's an idea. 
what if he could? What if through forest magic, this snow sculpture version of him gained sentience, and could speak to and manipulate Anna and Elsa? The movie already features a wedge forming between the two sisters as Elsa tries to do things herself. But maybe that idea could be further strengthened if the grandfather tried to manipulate Elsa into abandoning her sister under the guise of him saying she should do it to protect Anna. Like, you know how Elsa sends Anna and Olaf down the river in an ice boat and then she goes to the big magic iceberg by herself and nearly freezes to death? That's bad, right? That was her mistake, right? The movie was setting up that she needs to learn to let Anna in without charging headfirst into danger. Except, by doing exactly that, she's able to help save the day. She learns the information about her evil grandfather that she sends to Anna that causes her to inexplicably realize that she needs to destroy the dam. So the message is extremely muddled. Did Elsa do the right thing by going to this dangerous iceberg by herself or not? Well, there's an easy solution. Have her evil grandfather manipulate her into going deep into the iceberg. Maybe there's some sort of magic he needs Elsa's help to unlock the secrets of. Maybe he gets a whole snow army that he uses to try and defend the dam. And Anna, Kristoff, the soldiers, the Northolja, and the big rock dudes all need to band together to fight him. It would make for a really cool climactic final battle. Like, remember when Disney movies had those? Plus, the spirits got upset because the Arendellians started attacking the Northolja. How cool and poetic would it be for the two groups to unite in battle against the true enemy? The one that started the senseless bloodshed and angered the spirits in the first place. Yeah, it would involve more fighting, but that's the thing. There are always gonna be evil people in the real world, and sometimes there's no other way to defeat them except by fighting. Sometimes it's a necessary concession one needs to make in order for things to change. Plus, there could be moments where Matthias confronts his old boss over the atrocities he was unwittingly committing, thus justifying his existence as a character. And Anna could come into her own as a true heroine, and Kristoff could lead a bunch of reindeer into battle or something. I don't know, I think that would be funny. Now, yes, the unfortunate side effect here is that the grandfather would have to be a twist villain, something no one wants. But all you have to do to remedy that is to establish to us, the audience, that he's evil when Anna and Elsa aren't looking. That way, it's less about being a gotcha to the audience, and more about having us say, oh god, oh fuck, Anna and Elsa better watch out, this bitch ain't trustworthy. But that's just one idea with Frozen 2. There's like a million different ways you can improve the writing in this movie. It's not hard. Villain! Oh! oh. We all kind of got it. And then there's Raya and the Last Dragon, wow. Okay, so this one's a bit of a different case. This movie does have a villain, and a potentially really heinous one, if they could have actually committed to making her evil. Look, I've already dedicated a whole video to going into this movie's message on how much I don't like it, and how much I don't think Namari should have been redeemed, at least not in the way she was. So you can check that video out instead. But essentially, I think it's possible to have a movie about learning to trust other people again, while also making it clear that you shouldn't trust everyone. Especially not someone who has done nothing to show that they're worthy of trust. Raya doesn't trust the shrimp boy, or the con baby, or the big dude, but she ultimately learns that they're kind and caring people, and that trusting them is okay after she gets to know them better. But there are limits to trust, and Namari should not have been afforded it. You can make her a layered and interesting antagonist who regrets the state the world is in and the fact that she killed Sisu, but they should have either not redeemed her or let her realize the error of her ways and give Raya her gem piece. Just make it clear that she's the antagonist and the one that needed to change in order for any sort of positive relationship between her and Raya to work. Oh god, why am I still talking about this movie? Make it stop. Anyway, that's all the Disney movies that have released since the twist villain era ended. Is Pixar faring any better in this regard? Y yes but not by much. Before we get into that, however, let's hear a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. See, a villain wouldn't have saved Ralph Breaks the Internet, but maybe if they had gone to a website built by Squarespace, that might have saved the movie. We don't know, there's no proof that it wouldn't have. Anyway, Squarespace time. Squarespace is a fantastic, intuitive, online website builder that allows you to create beautiful websites for your business or personal hobby. Present your work using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs. Display projects in customizable galleries and add password protected pages to share private works with clients. You can even present your videos from YouTube, Vimeo, and Animoto on your Squarespace site. Add an image overlay to your video to improve your website's load speed by waiting to embed video players until playback starts. Every design automatically includes a unique mobile presence that matches the overall style of your website, so your content will look great on every device, every time. And if you don't want that, you can always disable the mobile view from Website Manager. Buying a domain from Squarespace is so 
simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Each domain comes with an ad-free parking page and free WHOIS privacy on eligible domains. Squarespace sells over 200 top-level domains so you can find the perfect name for your website. Choose a URL that ends in .com, .net, .org, or you can always get a more specific one like .art if you want to be fancy. If you're ready to share your passions or promote your business with the rest of the world, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Since the last twist villain in Incredibles 2, we've had six movies. And thankfully, the ones without villains do function. I like how Gabby Gabby isn't just a rehash of Stinky Pete or Lotso. They actually manage to talk things out with her and everything works out. For the Toy Story series, that's a pretty good subversion and it works pretty well. Onward and Turning Red are movies I don't like all too much, but neither of them need a villain. The ticking clock and generational trauma serve as fitting obstacles for the conflicts in these movies. That leaves Soul, which kind of has an antagonist in the form of Terry, who's really just trying to do their job as a soul counter and can't really be considered a villain. Which is fine, it still works. Then there's Luca, aha, this one's got a villain, and the villain is just kind of an asshole in the same vein as Chick Hicks and Skinner. I liked him when I first saw the movie, but I think I was just kind of starved for villains in these Pixar films, and was just ready to accept any mildly fun antagonist they gave me. He's not really a standout in the same vein as the studio's 2000s villains. And then there's Lightyear- WHAT THE F*** IS THIS?! OH MY GOD, WHAT THE F*** WERE YOU THINKING?! Apparently, it's not enough to just have an evil emperor from space be your main antagonist in a modern Pixar film. No, no, no. There's gotta be some sort of twist or aspect of relatability to him. So as a joke, some intern at Pixar told the director, What if it was Buzz from the future? And the director said, Phil, that's brilliant. Here are the keys to my house. Go f*** my life-size cardboard cutout of Buzz Lightyear. And then we got this shit. Literally everyone I know who has seen this movie, which isn't a lot of people to be fair, but everyone I know who's seen it hates this twist. And yeah, it's so stupid and illogical. Not only have alternate timeline versions of characters literally never come up once in the movie to this point, but there's no indication that the buzz we see throughout this movie could ever be capable of becoming this evil emperor. It's just ridiculous. We can't have this pure evil menacing robot guy as the villain. They keep creating new ways to justify having villains even though this dumbass way somehow makes his existence less justifiable. So that's all the recent Disney and Pixar films. Most of them don't have real villains, and the ones that do have villains mostly have pretty boring or terrible ones. Now, on the one hand, yes, it is possible to tell a compelling story without a real villain, as proven by movies like Encanto or Soul. But on the other hand, variety is the spice of life, and I feel like when so many of the movies from these studios are doing the exact same villainless shtick, it starts to get old. The same was true for the twist villain era in the mid-2010s, and now, after only one year, I think everyone's pretty sick of generational trauma as the driving antagonistic force. It was well liked in Encanto and Turning Red, but I haven't seen anyone praise Strange World for tackling similar concepts. This movie desperately needed a villain to rescue it from being so dull and played out and repetitive. And the same most likely applies to Disney's upcoming films. I'm sure some of the stories they want to tell can work without a villain, but I also feel like if this trend continues, we're gonna miss having traditional villains in our Disney movies more than ever. Especially if more movies like Puss in Boots The Last Wish come out. Movies that show that you can have compelling arcs for your protagonists, a fun adventurous journey, and a plethora of entertaining and wonderful villains. And as much as Goldilocks and Jack Horner put basically every main Disney or Pixar villain since King Candy to shame, especially Jack since he returns to the age-old classic tradition of incredibly entertaining, irredeemable monsters, even they pale in comparison to death. Basically everyone who's seen this movie unanimously agrees that this motherfucker is one of the greatest and most intimidating villains in any animated movie they've seen. But it actually goes even deeper than that. Death is the personification of Puss's anxieties. Puss has the same sort of personal struggle that modern Disney wants to put their protagonist through. And yet, he also has a terrifying, memorable, incredible antagonist to contend with. 
They go hand in hand because death isn't just some villain. He's the physical manifestation of Puss's internal conflict. The fear of death that has an emotional chokehold on him throughout the film, which he ultimately overcomes by the end. It's more than possible to have an intimidating, unforgettable villain that represents the core of what your main protagonist is struggling with. Therefore, Disney taking time away from making villains in order to develop their heroes more is no longer a valid excuse. You can do both and have both aspects soar. You don't have to worry about neglecting one or the other. This movie should be required viewing for everyone working at Disney, just so they can get an idea of what the f they could be doing, instead of making these lukewarm, samey, often fundamentally flawed, villainless films. And I wouldn't be pushing so hard for this if I didn't know that the studio could do it. Because they have. Not just in the past, but recently. The proof is there in, dare I say it, Tamatoa. Moana's story structure doesn't have room for a traditional main villain, but they made room for this delightful, classic-feeling side villain who's both funny and threatening, showing that the studio has absolutely still got it with villain making, as long as they actually have any interest in making them. The only real complaint I've heard anyone give this crab boy, aside from not liking Shiny as a song, which is fine, I'm fine with that, definitely, is that he should have been in the movie more. Some people see him as a weird detour, but this issue would have been alleviated if he played a more central role in the plot. Give him more screen time, and I think he absolutely lives up to the likes of Ursula, Jafar, Hades, and all the classic Disney villains we still know and love. But, no. We've gotten to the point where Disney filmmakers basically have to sneak classic Disney villains into their movies. It's sad and pitiful, and it makes these movies stand out a lot less, considering how oftentimes, the thing we remember most about Disney movies is their villains. Everyone remembers Sleeping Beauty for Maleficent. Everyone remembers 101 Dalmatians for Cruella de Vil. These villains are so iconic, and modern Disney knows this because they gave them their own solo movies. Whether or not they're good solo movies is up to you. I don't know, I haven't seen them yet. But they're proof that modern Disney is fully aware about the brand power of villains. And yet, the animated studio that created these iconic baddies either isn't allowed to or doesn't want to make anymore. Of course, we'll see what the future holds. The twist villain thing appears to have just been a phase since we haven't gotten one in a while. That day was his- I don't count Lightyear, by the way, because that's more of a twist surrounding the established villain, not a pre-established character who turns out to be evil. I mean, I guess it kind of is a pre-established character, but whatever, the movie sucks anyway, who cares? Whoa! The point is, twist villains are mostly out, so who's to say that villainless movies isn't also a phase? Maybe the studio will get back to their roots soon enough. Apparently, the next Disney animated film, Wish, will feature a villain described as one of the most formidable foes in Disney history. I find that statement vague and unconvincing. I quote tweeted it saying it's gonna be depression or self-doubt or something, and honestly, I was only half joking when I said that. There could be a real villain in this movie, or they could just be hyping us up for nothing and it's another personal struggle that the main protagonist has to deal with. I don't know, I guess we'll see. I mean, a movie all about the origin of the wishing star that has become such a staple of the Disney brand would certainly be a fitting way to hearken the return of real classic Disney villains, but I guess only time will tell. Also, I'm not holding my breath for the dumbass Fire Girl and Water Boy movie to have a villain either. All I know is, at the moment, it feels like Disney believes that it's impossible to give us an entertaining, unabashedly evil villain in the same movie as nuanced protagonists with personal struggles to work through over the course of a journey. And if they genuinely think there's no room for a villain, then that's just bad storytelling.